Solferino, northern Italy, the 24th of June, 1859. The French and Austrian armies fight a bloody battle. By the end of the day, almost 40,000 soldiers are either dead or lying wounded and abandoned on the battlefield. The medical services are unable to cope, and they have no special protection. Henri Dunant, a Swiss businessman traveling through the area, arrives at Solferino hours after the battle. He's revolted by what he sees. This is appalling. Nothing to be done about it. Wars like that. <gasps> Dunant organized first aid, convincing local people to look after all the wounded, both French and Austrian. We are all brothers in suffering. You there! What's the meaning of this? We've won, and now you are looking after our enemies. That is treason, sir. Let me explain, Colonel. And how do you intend to get hold of the dressings and medicines you'll need? I'm prepared to pay for them myself, but there is something you can do. Speak. What do you need? Release the Austrian doctors, orderlies, and surgeons you took prisoner and send them to me. Is that all? You're audacious in your request. <laughs> Not a bad idea, I suppose. I'll see what I can do. Thank you, Colonel. All I care about are the wounded. Back in his native Geneva, Dunant doesn't forget. In 1862, he publishes A Memory of Solferino. The book contains two major ideas. Set up relief committees in time of peace to train volunteers who would treat the wounded in time of war. He's a dreamer. This led to the National Red Cross and Red Crescent Society. No, he's right. Something must be done. Draw up an international agreement to recognize and protect these committees. This formed the basis of international humanitarian law, IHL. In 1863, Dunant and four other citizens of Geneva founded the International Committee of the Red Cross, ICRC. This will be a universal symbol to protect Army Medical Corps personnel on the battlefield. So they won't be attacked, and all the wounded get treated, whichever side they're on. 1864, the Convention for the Amelioration of the Condition of the Wounded in Armies in the Field is adopted. In 1876, Turkey decides to use the Red Crescent, considering it more in line with local culture. In 1901, the very first Nobel Peace Prize is awarded to Henri Dunant. The number of conflicts is rising, proving the relevance of his basic idea to preserve a little humanity in the midst of war. Written rules governing methods of war start to appear. The 1907 Hague Convention prohibits the use of poisoned weapons and the execution of soldiers who have surrendered. There are 42 national societies in action by the time of the First World War. During the First World War, Modern industry is able to produce weapons in such quantity that millions are killed, both military and civilian. Gas is used on a large scale. Some volunteers work at the front. Others assemble parcels of clothing, food, tobacco, glasses or medicine. The ICRC delivers millions of letters and parcels to prisoners despite blockades and fronts. The war ends in 1918, but it is followed by a health disaster. Spanish flu kills more people than four years of war. In 1919, the national societies set up a league to coordinate their work. We have to look after displaced persons, fight famine, and epidemics, rebuild the health services. The movement becomes more and more universal. New conflicts break out in Spain, Ethiopia and China. 
civilians are attacked regularly. These violent conflicts foreshadow the mass destruction of the Second World War. Prisoners of war receive over 36 million parcels and 120 million letters. ICRC delegates visit prisoner of war camps to verify that POWs are being treated in accordance with the 1929 Geneva Convention. But nobody prevents the deliberate killing during the war of millions of people, notably Jews. The world reaches new levels of barbarity. In 1949, states revise existing humanitarian law treaties and adopt a new one to protect civilians in times of war. These are the four Geneva Conventions in force today. Even wars have limits. Right, right. Yeah, right. IHL is based on two fundamental ideas. People who aren't fighting are to be protected. The choice of weapons and of methods of war are limited. In 1977, two protocols are added to the Geneva Conventions. A third protocol in 2005 gives national societies the possibility of using an additional emblem, the red crystal. The ICRC protects and assists the victims of war and explains to all combatants the rules they must obey. If a combatant surrenders, he must be treated decently. We've heard that some of your fighters burned down a village near the river. We'll deal with whoever was responsible. Victims of war receive the food and other items they need to survive. There's enough for everyone. Medical teams operate on casualties at the front. Delegates dig wells, vaccinate livestock. Orthopedic centers care for people who have lost limbs, often through landmines. See, you can do it. Families separated by war use satellite phones or write Red Cross messages to keep in touch. ICRC traces missing people and reunites them with their families. Oh, at last we're back together. During a conflict, the ICRC makes sure that the physical and psychological well-being of captured soldiers and detained civilians is respected. I must remind you that torture and ill-treatment are prohibited. Where necessary, delegates try to improve the physical conditions of detention. This is how we intend to renovate the cells. Working as a neutral intermediary, the ICRC can repatriate prisoners of war and civilian internees at the end of a conflict. National Society volunteers play a vital role because they know the situation on the ground. When violence is at its worst, they may well be the only ones who can get to the victims. But there's more than just war. Natural disasters affect millions of people every year, including earthquakes. Climate change is exacerbating the consequences of droughts, hurricanes and floods. Many people don't know the basic rules of hygiene. They have difficulty obtaining enough safe water and health care is inadequate. The International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which succeeded the League set up in 1919, coordinates the work of the national societies. It helps them to prepare for and respond to epidemics and disasters, both natural and man-made. AIDS is spreading across the world, destroying entire communities. Lives are threatened by seemingly minor diseases. Get back from the shore! A tsunami is coming! National societies invest heavily in first aid training. In an emergency, simple actions can save lives. The International Red Cross and Red Crescent movement follows principles that earn it the confidence and respect of all. 
an important principle is neutrality. Because it refuses to take sides, its members should have access to everyone in need. The movement has to be independent, so as not to give in to public opinion or political pressure. Being impartial means trying to help everyone, starting with those whose need is most urgent, and not discriminating on the basis of race, religion, political persuasion or social status. To ensure that help is provided to all, there must only be one national society in any given country. By being open to all, the national society avoids the temptation to help only one group. Millions of volunteers, most of them young, make up the biggest humanitarian movement in the world. They are motivated not by profit, but by a desire to relieve the suffering of those most in need. National societies have a duty to help each other. The movement aims to protect life and health and to promote respect for the individual. It supports mutual understanding, friendship, cooperation and enduring peace between peoples. In 2007, the movement was made up of the ICRC, the International Federation and 185 national societies.